Hi, this is James Wine. This is James the Wine Guy. And as I promised uh, to finally have a guest to uh, talk with um, in my wine interviews, and uh, or it's my, my beginning wine interview, which is really important because it's not all about me. It's about the wines. It's about the people behind who make the wine. So today I have Derek Rolfs, and he is the uh, principal and winemaker uh, and uh, visionary for Bravium Wines. And I'll show you, we'll, I'll bring this a little closer so you can see this. This is his Chardonnay, and this is Thompson Vineyard in Napa Valley, Caneros. And for me, I'm really excited to have you here today. This is really nice. And uh, I'd really like to, you know, have you talk about yourself. And, you know, what was your vision? How did you become a winemaker? What was the pinnacle moment that you said, I am going to, um, based on that 1973 Chateau Latour, mm -hmm. I'm going to be a winemaker. You think there would be a bottle behind it, right? Yeah. It started it all? Yeah. Um, there were many bottles, and I would, it would be impossible for me to pinpoint a moment. Mm -hmm. um, I moved back to California in 2000, and just being in Northern California in the middle of you know such amazing Appalachians and checking out as many wineries as I could, I, the whole thing grew organically, really. Mm -hmm. I just... You know, there's only so long you can drink wine and read about wine before you get a hankering to make it, I think. Okay, so at one point you said, I'm going to be a winemaker, but that excluded maybe being a, you know, insurance adjuster or a <laughs> computer uh, coder, yeah. HTML coder. I mean, there must have been something like, I really think, because it's, a, I think it's a commitment. You can't just go into winemaking because you're going to do that. I think there's something inside that really makes you go that direction. Right. I, 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 I did keep my day job for a number of years while I made wine out of my garage, basically. Okay. Um, and while I was doing that, I took some coursework at Davis, uh, winemaking 101, literally. <laughs> and, and, uh, um, and, you know, a lot of trial and error and, and seeing how it would go. And again, it kind of grew organically, just mm -hmm. grew into to more and more production and then the desire to be, become a bonded winery. Okay. And, uh, you know. Now you've been doing this for 10 years. Yeah. Have you been doing this all in the city of San Francisco? Uh, basically between the peninsula and San Francisco in 2007, um, uh, Jim Murawski uh, found a location for a winery on Treasure Island. It was the first winery on Treasure Island. Now there are six. Okay. And um, I, I uh, found Jim shortly thereafter and, and, and moved my operations up there and bonded the winery on Treasure Island and have been there since. Okay. Now that brings into question, or not into question, into point out the urban wine, winemaking experience. Mm -hmm. Now I think there's a group of people who have a preconceived notion as to what it is, either positive or negative. Sure. Um, I have a specific view on urban winemaking. I think it's an amazing thing. It's a great uh, place to be because when you think about urban winemaking, you don't need to be in Napa or Paso Robles or in a specific McLaren Vale. You, you can be in the city of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, it's about transportation, and I'm sure there's someone's going to point out, well, blah, 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 the grapes are you know, transported a certain distance and they're injured, but I don't think that's really the, um, an issue in my opinion. Right. Uh, but I'd like to know more, you know, what are the, the positives or what are the, the myths that might be surrounding urban winemaking? Yeah, that's a really good question. I probably have three perspectives on it. I'd start with the historical mm -hmm. perspective, which is, I mean, San Francisco 100 years ago was a, you know, a, a huge winemaking community. There were hundreds of, of wineries in, in the city. Sure. And uh, then the earthquake happened and, and the, the wineries were rebuilt and then, and then prohibition happened. And, and after that, we kind of lost that, that history and that momentum that that existed. So um, this is kind of the third wave to, to my perspective of winemaking in the city. Mm -hmm. I think it's great in that regard. Um, I think the wines or the grapes, if we pick in the middle of the night or we pick early in the morning and bring the fruit in early, um, I don't think they really care a whole lot where they're being <laughs> turned into wine. Sure. Um, and it can be a little challenging. Some of the vineyards I work with in Anderson Valley, it's a, it's a bit of a, a hike to get that fruit in, sure. but we're very careful again about how we do it and when we do it. So um, I think it's great just because it's, you know, we are in the middle of so many great vineyards um, and we're bringing the wineries to, to the people. Really. Sure, sure. Um, now that said, I can't say five or 10 years from now, you know, if I'll be um, making wine in an urban setting or, or in an urban and a, a more rural or traditional winemaking, you know, area, but okay. uh, we'll see. Do people come into your tasting room and say, oh, well, this is a good Pinot Noir, but blah, blah, blah. It could be better in um, the setting on the Rio Grande or Santa Rita Hills. I, I mean, I think you have to talk people off a cliff sometimes. A little bit. I, I think I think most people, 90% plus of the people, once you explain what you're doing and, and, and kind of the conversation you and I just had, mm -hmm. they... They just worry about the quality of the wine and what's in the bottle. Mm -hmm. um, I think 10% of the people are kind of wishing for a idyllic, 
you know, rolling vineyard <laughs> to look out upon sure. as they as they taste their wine. And I get that too. You know, I, I like to visit, um, you know, visit wine country, so to speak, um, as well. But uh, I think, uh, you know, some of my winemaking mentors and my favorite people in the business started in, in warehouses and in really inauspicious buildings. Sure. Um, and I don't, I don't think there's anything um, necessarily wrong with that. Good, good. Um, first of all, you have several labels. You have your um, Bravium series, and you have your um, your artist series. Is that artisan artisan yeah. series? That's right. Yeah. Uh, so here's an example of this. So we have this here, and I've reviewed this wine. This is the uh, the uh, Midnight Oil. This is the Syrah. I think it's first of all the labels. Really, I think one of the the only labels of its kind that I've ever seen. I think it's amazingly cool, but well, all the contents are really cool too. Uh, so for me, I think this is a really great talk point for, you know, how did you uh, break down the point of um, your um, both series? What, what was the philosophy behind that? Right. So early in my winemaking, I started to gravitate towards Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, you realize, I think early on, you need to make wine for your own palate and wine that you like to make and drink. Mm -hmm. And hopefully other people will like it as well. Sure. So um so Pinot Noir and Chardonnay was what I decided to um, commit the flagship brand Bravium to, mm -hmm. and it's it's vineyard designated wines. Um, they, I, I follow the same winemaking practice every year. I follow the same barrel uh, regime every year. Sure. Um, the idea is to let the vineyard and the vintage speak through the wine, and and not me so much. Um, the artisan wines, I, I while I was excited about making Pinot Noir and Chardonnay under the Bravium label. I still had a hankering to make, you know, some Syrah and, uh, and some other, some other varieties work with those and just see what stuck basically, what vineyard, what variety, and it kind of took on a life of its own. And, uh, I produced, uh, 12 different, um, varietal wines and blends, um, last year. Okay. Now that's a good uh, question for me, which is how did you get to that point? And you're, you're producing Cabernet Sauvignon, you're producing Petite Syrah, uh, Chardonnay. Um, how did you get there? Oh gosh, this is a five minute interview right here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Part two. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know how to answer that question. Okay. I'm sorry. No, no worries. <laughs> I mean, in, 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 short, in a short time frame. I think um, what I've decided is I, I've, I've taken some of the sensibilities of Bravium, some of those um, less is more philosophies, and tried to apply it to some of the independent ones where I think, you know, in some cases that might be lacking in the marketplace. Okay. Okay. That, that's a great answer because I don't know how I could have answered that question either. Uh, I <laughs> think it's a good one. Yeah, it's, it's a great question because when you think about it, um, you know, I probably would, if I was a winemaker, I would be having at least a dozen to a dozen and a half because I couldn't just settle on one wine. Uh, that would be, of course, if you were gifted with the resources and were a good business person because it's not easy making wine. First of all, technically it's hard. Secondly, um, we have 40,000 distribution laws in the United States related to alcohol beverage control. So with that, you have a lot of barriers, which shouldn't be in the world's largest wine market. Um, but that's a fortitude of winemakers um, uh, like uh, Derek. I think he does an amazing job. He has, you know, th that point of, um, of understanding the, the vineyard. And so Thompson, this is the, um, the Chardonnay here. It's a really cool, I actually looked up, they have a website. And they source to, I want to say about at least a dozen producers um, in Napa Valley and to yourself as well. And they, they really go, they, they love what they do. You can just tell by their website. They give some great explanations and uh, data points. Mm -hmm. I really like that. So you want to talk a little bit about what we're drinking? Yeah, this is the, the 2010 vintage for, as you said, Thompson Vineyard in Napa Carneros. Um, it's a blend of three Dijon clones, um, basically a field blend of, of Chardonnay clones. And uh, the idea with this wine is to, um, as with most of my wines, I try to retain some of the natural acidity of the wine, make them food friendly and balanced. And so um, this wine does not see any uh, oak and it also doesn't go through a secondary fermentation. So it's not oaky, it's not buttery. It's a little more of an acid profile you might find in a Chablis sure. or in a, in a more traditional French wine. Sure. This is a beautiful wine, and I'm going to review this in, an own, in its own video. As I always say, each wine deserves its own wine review and wine video. For me, I think a lot of people uh, discount Chardonnay and Caneros for reasons that are, are based on someone else's palate, some else's, uh, some other person's um, or tastemaker's uh, palate, which is unfair. 
So I think this is a beautiful wine to enjoy with, um, I would enjoy some lobster, popcorn, truffle popcorn. Mm -hmm. There's so many things that could go with this. Fettuccine Alfredo. There you go. <laughs> there you go. And uh, Derek's website, which I definitely will put on the end of this video and all the channels that I release this to, uh, take a look at his website because there's some recipes on the website for each of his wines that he releases on a yearly basis. So I, not to keep this as a 10 minute interview, um, but I just like to ask, um, you know, in closing, um, you know, first of all, your aging capacity, how long can maybe your Pinot Noir or your Syrah age? I, I think, you know, the wines that, that I've made to date, I mean, I've, I've been at it, like you said, for 10 years. Um, I think most of the wines improve up to their fifth year and, and the fifth through 10th year, they're still doing, doing great. Sure. Um, I, I think again, that acidity, you know, and the balance of the wine. Will, will allow that graceful aging um, beyond 10 years, time will tell. Okay, okay, <laughs> that's a fair answer. I, I think that's a tough question too. You know, it all depends on the varietal, it depends on the vintage the as vintage, well. vintage, absolutely, yeah, just yeah. a lot of variables there. And what I find amazing about Derek's wines is his price points. They're extremely approachable. Something that I think is, um, you can go to Napa right now, maybe I shouldn't use Napa, but uh, some ABAs in California, you're gonna find really expensive wines and um, they're not, they wouldn't have been that way 10 years ago. But I look at your uh, set of wines and I think they're completely, completely approachable. Your Cabernet Sauvignon, I think, is $39. Right. Um, and it's how? Diamond Mountain. Yeah. Okay. So on some of the independent wines, the, the artisan wines, mm -hmm. um, they, uh, they, I've been able to, to work with fruit um, sometimes on an ongoing basis, but sometimes on a one-time basis. So some of those are, are fleeting moments of, of value mm -hmm. and, and uh, whatever ends up in the bottle. Um, with uh, whereas with Bravium, I, you know, I'm, I'm working with these vineyards on for the long term sure. in the long haul. So um, I can't always promise I'll have a thirty dollars yeah. cab just yeah. to be real upfront about sure, it. But sure. um, but where where I get the opportunity to work with a great vineyard at a, at, you know at, and to produce a, a wine that's I think a good value, I'll, I'll continue to do so. Good, good. And and for me, I think um, I'm partial to mountain fruit in uh, Napa. I think it's it's an amazing thing to have and experience. So if you haven't tried it. Um, I think you saw bottles of that available, right? Of yes. your Diamond Mountain Cabernet There's Sauvignon? Very little left. Yeah. Okay, uh, 2007, right? 2007. Okay. When I come to the winery. Yeah. <laughs> when I taste it, it was absolutely sterling. It's a beautiful wine. And, um, I, but don't, you know, Derek is saying that that's a one-timer. But guess what? You go to Napa Valley and you go to any producer and they're in the same situation too. So, it, it, you know, small producer, large producer, they're all in the same situation year over year. One of the producers I go to in Oak, Oak Mill District, uh, they had Diamond Mountain and actually um, their lot was uh, owned by the Davies family. So the Davies said, oh, we're going to use that grape. We're going to use all that fruit for our production of Cabernet Sauvignon. So that's what happens. Yeah. Um, and in final, in closing, two things. One would be, um, first of all, ask well, the person that most inspired you to be who you are today in terms of maybe a winemaker or the person who you are, a oh, wow. uh, winemaker or not. And um, maybe any closing thoughts on, on your uh, philosophy of winemaking? Right. I'll, I'll stick to the, the winemaking <laughs> <laughs> inspirations. Um, leave my family, my dad out of this for now. <laughs> but uh, um, in, in the wine world, you know, from a viticulture and a, and a, and a winemaking standpoint, that's really easy for me. It's uh, um, Kevin Harvey and Jeff Brinkman at Reese um, Winery in San, Santa Cruz Mountains. Um, I, I think what they're doing and, and how they're going about it is uh, paradigm shifting and, and just, uh, I think they, they're the be all and end all in, in California as far as, as Pinot Noir and Chardonnay production. Sure. Uh, as, as far as um, so another really great person I met in the, in the, in the wine world um, is Roger Scamegna, who's partners with uh, Joel Gott and Charles mm. Wheeler at Three Thieves. And sure. he's turned into a friend. I actually uh, produced Pinot Noir from his vineyard, um, Signal Ridge Vineyard in, in Anderson Valley. Okay. And uh, he's also um, helping me a little bit with the business side <laughs> oh, good. of things. Okay. So um, he's a great guy and, and somebody I take inspiration from. Okay. Good. And any final thoughts on maybe what's coming up next at Bravium or, um, you know, you, you just signed a contract for varietal X or Y or... Yeah, there are, there are a lot of things going on. Um, the most things I'm most excited about right now is the fact that we're ramping up our, our Pinot Noir production. Um, we produced uh, five different vineyard designated Pinot Noirs last year mm -hmm. that are still in barrel getting ready to be bottled in the next coming months. Sure. And, um, and we're also... Uh, partnering on a planning of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir and Carneros. Okay. And uh, so oh. that won't uh, really, you know, come online for another few years, but, okay. but that's exciting for, for me. 
That's great. And that's especially hard to do, especially with, uh, uh, I know that this is a video that's going to live on for quite some time. Uh, right now, California has a grape shortage, uh, from what I understand. So to acquire that, it's all about relationships still. Um, you may think that it's um, just such a corporatized uh, experience, but when you come to California, I think there is that um, you know reality. But the other reality is winemakers like uh, Derek producing, <clears throat> excuse me, phenomenal wines and great price points, quality. And when you get to talk to the winemaker and you get a Treasure Island, you can talk to him, and he is just uh, a, a fountain of information and uh, truly cares about what he does. And for me, I just am passionate about that. So this video, you know, it's my longest video of, of ever, but it wasn't about me, which I'm really happy about. Uh, but it's it's about the winemaker. And I'm gonna do more of these because there's so many people that I wanna interview and so many people I meet all the time that have, uh, really don't get to have their own spotlight, if you will. And so it was a really great pleasure to have you here. And I'm really excited that you, you know, came on over to do this video. So thank you. Thank you. Cheers James. and salute. For more wine reviews, please go to jamesthewineguy.com. Please subscribe to my videos on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Vimeo, Google+, Pinterest. Salud.